My name's Charlie Guthrie. Uh, I'm from the training providers AS Training and Survivex. This is a part of a series of webinars we're doing. Um, so please, if you haven't registered already, uh, we're joining Atlas Professionals tomorrow. Uh, they're talking about emergency response courses and um, getting careers as, as roustabouts offshore. So they'll be talking about their green hand programs. So you can find details about that through the AS Training and the Survivex websites if you go to our news pages and you can register for that. Even if you can't make it, do register, we'll, we'll send you a copy of the video afterwards. But today I'm with Sean from Wood um, and I'm also with uh, Steve, who's our subject matter expert here at AS Training for the lifting operations. Um, so Sean, as, as, well as a, sorry, as well as a raft of other things, Sean will look after the lifting operations and the resourcing and recruiting people for those roles. Uh, Steve, as well as being subject matter expert, is a, an instructor with us down here at our Newcastle facility. Uh, remember, as we go through, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Uh, some people will just have to move their mouse uh, and that will come up. So fire questions through as we go. We'll do about 20 minutes uh, talking about different bits of lifting operations, the courses, the job roles, uh, demand for skills. And then the last 10 minutes, we'll talk through some of the questions and we'll answer as many as we can. So I think, Steve, if we start with you, um, be good if you could just talk us through, you know, what, what are the differences between a stage one and a stage two and then a three and a four for a, a rigger and then a banksman? Yeah, well, your stage one getting into the career is your basic training. So you come into to a train provider like ourselves, you do your initial training, which is based over three days, which shows you how to use equipment correctly, which you will find typically within the industry. So over the three days, we show you how to use the, the equipment, how to use the equipment, how to follow lift plans. And once you've done the initial training, you then go into the workplace, or hopefully trying to get employment in the workplace, where you can further your career by getting your stage two logbook experience, which is your workplace experience filled in. There's certain tasks within the logbook you need to get signed off and completed. So again, it's a two year validation certificate to get your logbooks filled in. You can do it as quick as 50 days, I do believe, certain tasks over the 50 days, so there's 50 tasks. Once you've completed that, like I say, within the two year period, you come back to be assessed to the level three standard, which is an assessment. So you've gone from the one training, the two, your logbook workplace experience, and then you come back and do your level three, which is the competency assessment, which is no longer training. It's an assessment just to validate that you have Obviously, you met the criteria, you can use the equipment, you can follow lift plans, and then after the training, sorry, after the assessment, you will then be deemed a competent rigger. So that's your stage three. Um, again, it's valid for two years, and within the two years, you've just got to keep coming back to refresh it. But the first time you come back after year three, you move on to your stage four, which is more or less the same assessment, same criteria. But like I say, it's just a two year continual evaluation um, and it doesn't go any higher than the four so you're working okay. away from the initial training which is the one your workplace experience which is your two you move on to your competency assessment which is your three and then it's a revalidation every two years which is your four continuous okay that's really good summary and essentially i assume it's the same process whether it's the rigging or the banksman courses yes very very different skill sets but yeah very similar. The only difference with the Banksman Slinger is um, it takes a little bit longer to get your logbooks filled in. It's a 50-day process minimum for okay. the, the rigging, and I believe it's 57 days for the Banksman Slinger. Okay, so for, for both, you've got your workplace elements, but then you've got you know roughly a minimum of two months, a little bit less than two months, to get that work workplace experience up. You have a supervisor sign off your different... Yes tasks yes. um but i suppose as a typical delegate is it i guess it's not two months typically it's much longer than that yeah i would always say to anybody once i've done the training get as much as the kind of certificate anyway it's a two-year certificate so get as much training much workplace experience as you can and um, you may get your logbook filled in pretty quick but i wouldn't rush back until you've actually got you know what i'm saying the confidence the confidence and you're happy to come back to be reassessed yeah and if you don't again just go down the route of training if you don't actually want to go up to the next level you can still keep coming back and just refreshing your level one training okay so yeah employers do look to the level threes and level fours 
as the more competent personnel. And I guess from a, a delegate's point of view, you've got a two-year uh, certificate there. So why would you do that after six months? You might as well let the two-year run unless you really wanted to get up to that three and four as quick as exactly, possible. Exactly, because as we all know, these courses aren't cheap. So you want to try and get as much as you can on the certificate anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Sean, I think most of our questions this afternoon are probably focused on you. You're, you're a resource for a lot of the people watching will be interested in the, the jobs at the end of it. Um, would primarily take on stage three and fours, um, which is partly what we we're just discussing there. What, why is that? Well, I guess there's no, I guess there's a number of answers for it, really. I guess if, if you wanted to be technical as would as a service company, what we actually do is we agree certain matrices with our clients who set the requirements that they ask for us for rigors to hold. So dependent on the client, a people stage three is the minimum. Just realistically, that is what is in the rigging and lifting procedures of the client. That's what we have to stick to. Um, certain other clients require additional certification over and above that, but that's, I guess, the minority rather than the majority. I think if you look at it purely from a candidate perspective, I think we've just spoken about it there. It's a training course to then gain an assessment. What we would prefer is if people are coming with the stage three, well, that's obviously our, our base standard is what we would like people to have. But if people are sitting a stage one assessment and then looking to go into an industry where it's a permitted industry where there's a lot of, lot of different trades moving about we want the most experienced people to be out there so we want them to have a level of competence when they're doing it if they're working in smaller teams that they don't really doubt their ability more than anything yeah. i guess is the most important part of it because i think what we what we've just spoken about there is the fact that the minimum period to move from that training course to the assessment was 50 days and then 57 for the banksman. In all honesty, we would be looking for people to have proved an ongoing competence. So if we send them out, because the majority of work that we resource for, unfortunately, doesn't allow for someone to go out and get used to their environment, used to their workplace, and then fill out the logbook. We're resourcing people to go out and cover a period of absence or a longer term sickness period or even shut down and um, which is when the platform stops producing oil and gas so they actually just need to put as many people who have the highest level of competence out to complete the tasks and in all honesty the majority of the time so they can complete the task rigging specifically they're never on their own because of the tasks they're achieving they have to have a two-man team when they're out there but if we were sending a two-man team to go out and do something and unfortunately one of them was only a stage one it really inhibits the task they can actually complete offshore and um, they wouldn't actually be able to handle a lot of the equipment they wouldn't be able to sign off a lot of the jobs they're doing so the client because a minimum bed in space is spe specifically for offshore assets i would say they want the stage threes and fours out there so it's a full resource they can have them moving around they're competent they're confident enough to be able to look at any job that is going on out there and achieve it it's not to say that we won't ever take stage ones. We have been known to in the past. I guess pri primarily, though, it will be stage three and four for both Riggin and Banksman Slinger for the reason that we're sending them offshore for a short period of time. We need them to complete that scope on time. And unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity or bed space to make sure that the stage one would have someone there talking them through it really making themselves feel confident about that yeah and i guess there's a, there's a couple of things i've picked up there one is yes you're talking as wood but this isn't a wood policy on its own you know this is across the board so this is the your clients your customers that are saying this is what it is and you're fulfilling what what they ask for so it's it's not just wood uh, but also it's a really good point you know you're, you're in a small team and if you had two stage ones out there and one turns the other and said, how do you do this? I mean, that, that's not going to work. If there's two people, even if there's, there's doubt, you're, you're in the middle of the North Sea, you can't have doubts about what you're doing. It's too risky an environment. Um, so it makes complete sense. Um, and I, I think with that in mind, you know, I'm, I'm jumping ahead to a question I was going to ask a bit later, but how, how have you seen people coming through that career path to get to a stage three? 
because from how you describe it, you know, if you're a, you're a stage one, getting work directly offshore isn't impossible, but isn't easy. Um, so are you seeing people with stuff on their CV where they've done other work or what sort of other work have they done? Yeah, in all honesty, two different methods that we've seen, well, three. Um, I guess the industry isn't quite what it was, but I guess the majority of the rigging population that we currently use tend to be within a certain age bracket and they're within that age bracket because they've either actually been of benefit of actually serving their time as a rigger um, and have been able to go through and then have been able to get gain their certain level of competence and fill in their logbook because they've been working within that role and are actually certified when that also either time served apprenticeship or have been through a vocational qualification and then a lot of the skills are transferable over and then can gain the competence from there. They can, I guess, work their way up on the asset. What we have had some success on in the past is during busier times, we would hire um, a sort of semi-skilled or unskilled position, which is called the general assistant, um, probably on the same level as what your other provider are going to be coming on and talking more about green hand roust about programs. It, it works quite similarly. If we can get someone offshore in a general assistant role who has actually completed their stage one training, if, if their job's big enough and we can pair them up in the right team, and it would we're lucky that we have quite a lot of people offshore who are actually either assessors or are really keen on developing people. We've noticed that um, we've been quite successful in getting general assistants helping out with jobs where they can actually start completing their logbook because of that and then either by maintaining employment with wood or even after leaving wood they've got the lifts in their logbook and can go and complete the actual assessment and then they're more than as long as they pass then the rigging knowledge test that would put them through they're absolutely more than capable of being a rigger or banksman in their own right and then i guess the third option is you don't specifically have to be offshore to complete these lifts as long as you can actually provide evidence to say that you are completing the tasks that are within your logbook. So it's predominantly the oil and gas industry and it's predominantly offshore where it's in a lot of the rigging and lifting procedures and I guess in a lot of ours and our competitors base standards that we would like the stage threes or stage fours. I guess within sort of other industries, you may be able to complete these lifts as well and keep signing off your logbook and then long term if you want to get in the oil and gas industry as a stage three or four rigger you'll have completed it in a different industry and then look to transition in a new industry so i guess there's three i yeah. guess very different ways that you could potentially get to the stage where you would be suitable to hire within the oil and gas industry for wood yeah so i guess you're to, to summarize those you've got your your existing rigger that's you know mm -hmm. been doing it for years and years and, and goes through the time served or the apprenticeship room you've got the person that is in a doing rigging and banksman but in a slightly different sector maybe it's onshore petrochemical or, or something like that and then if anyone's watching that's almost brand new coming into the industry you're getting onto an oil rig as your first step so actually you're, you're doing your banksman one or your rigger one not with intention of becoming a rigger or a banksman directly, but your aim is to get on as an assistant or as a roustabout and then move sideways into what your your end goal is at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And to be honest with you, it's a good point you make about, about roustabouts because as a production side company, it's not something we would hire. However, um, the drilling industry is one area where over the years, the production sort of, customers for lack of a better word have been good for taking people from and um, the activity and skill set is ever so slightly different um, and i think to the extent now that there is separate appeal qualifications for whether you're a rigger or a banksman on production or drilling side but it never used to be the case so what was a successful route for a lot of people is they may start off on the drilling side because they're achieving similar tasks but not identical, they would have gained that certification as well. And then production side companies would give them an opportunity. And there you go, you've managed to flip someone from being drilling to production and they have the relevant certification. But um, I believe um, as of last year, 
so rigging qualifications have by a PO have different uh, coding numbers and there is now different training for drilling side for stage th for stage three and four rigging there's goodness me I've forgotten the coding but uh, 9099 and 9199 for production side and for the drilling side there are separate rigging and banksman qualifications you can do great great um and you know as as would you you recruit a lot of people i guess particularly at this time of year but how do you go about recruiting teams where where are you advertising these holes who who do you look for in a person when you're looking at a cv what are kind of the things ticking your boxes yeah in all honesty yeah, i guess it's twofold and um, uh, there's two separate questions there i guess i'll answer the yeah. first one in terms <laughs> of what we're looking for so i've mentioned a couple of times the wood based standards what they are is they are a pre-agreed set of minimum training requirements that someone would need to fulfill one of our roles. So if we take rigging, the minimum requirements are the appeal qualification, stage three or four, um, a working at height unit two, which is, it's not a competence, it's just a training course. So it's something that people come without. It's not a deal breaker if they come with it. It's better for us because we can get someone away quicker. Um, we also need offshore certification as well. So BOSI, MIST, OG UK Medical. So we would check first and foremost that they had all of those. If they had all of those, then we would go on, a, you know, go and look at their work history. So in all honesty, we don't, we're not saying they've had to predominantly have been offshore. If they've been offshore, great. So just like any resourcing team will check suitability for employment based on if they've completed similar roles. But even if they've not been offshore, what we'd look for is we'd look for work in the likes of, you know, shipyards. We look for work in heavy industrial places, petrochemical, anything that would, would have been predominantly classed as, I guess, downstream or process and energy type um, places. So there's relevant sectors. There's relevant sectors, even the likes of chemical plants and um, some good places that we used to get take take people from is like you know the shipyard that was Harland and Wolf over in Belfast you know we look at the likes of some of our other support sites as well OGN in Newcastle you know places like that absolutely superb places to be taken from because the important piece that we look for is irrespective if they haven't been or not and it's something that you know I've had constantly have discussions with internally with like our head of rigging and lifting with as well as I guess one of the most important parts is if as long as they're coming from an industry where they are used to the fact that they have to follow guidelines and follow a permit system so in terms of you have to achieve each step to ensure the job is safe because I guess job safety is one of the most important parts for us so if they're coming from a background where they have been used to a permitted system they have the correct qualifications and experience absolutely would look at them irrespective of if they've been offshore or not yeah can I just ask you, Sean, obviously, like you say, the more um, skill sets you have, the more employable you are. Um, mm -hmm. Would you also look at NVQ route? Absolutely. A lot of our clients, specifically within their rigging and lifting procedure, have the fact that they can't sign off their lift plans without a vocational qualification. So predominantly now they move in engineering construction loads. Right. Um, so in Scotland, that's an SEQF level six. And in England, it's an NVQ level three. Yeah. Um, so some clients specifically have that. Some of them don't, but it's one of these things for all of our clients for offshore, unless the vocational qualification has been achieved within the last two years, yeah. they still ask for the PO certification as well. Right, so it's basically okay. both. It's one, yeah. not just one, it's both. Yeah, that's fine. It is both. Um, but not for all clients. We will take people who don't have it for probably, I'd say, about 90% of our clients. It's just the odd, not odd in a bad way, but it's just the, you know, ones and twos of clients who, who would require that. And because you're talking about cross-skilling as well, a lot of our assets actually really enjoy people who have both rigging and banksman tickets. Mm -hmm. Um predominantly for a lot of our covers with some of our clients where we're covering people who would be core crew. The reason being is as the offshore industry has changed and bedding capacity has become, I guess, even more critical with only wanting to have certain levels of people out there. If you can have rigging 
and Banksman Slinger, when you're out there, it saves having two separate people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Steve, I know we see people coming through, and we certainly used to a combined course, but even now they'll do one after the other yeah. to get both tickets. It's basically like uh, Sean said, uh, if you've got the same skill set, Banksman Slinger, rigging, uh, you're more employable. Yeah. Um, and if you've come from a background with NVQ, again, um, it's highly likely you will get employed quite quickly yeah. because you've got the background and the knowledge. And again, you're pushing yourself forward by doing the extra training as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Sean, how do how do people apply for jobs we would? Because, you know, at a very basic level, I see your posts on LinkedIn and looking for X, Y, Z. Uh, I'm sure there's possibly a slightly more formal route than that as well. Yeah, there is. If you um, go to the woodplc.com website, we have an entire separate career section. It'll drive you through to our resourcing system, which is called iSIMS. It's just a Microsoft-based resourcing system, and I can never remember what the acronym stands for. Apologies. Um, but yeah, it'll drive you through that. You have to create a profile, and you tick a box to basically say we're okay to use your information just as per GDPR regulations. And then you have a profile with us and um, you can go on and apply from, for jobs. You can search jobs globally um, and the jobs that we do put online will always have the prerequisites that are required for the role. So you can apply for roles that you're suitable for. Great. That's really good. Um, we kind of come to our 20 minutes and there's a, a couple of questions uh, coming in now. Um, so just before I do, I was, the last question I had was around work scopes and, you know, for those that, uh, I don't know if there's anyone listening to the webinar who isn't already a, a one, a three, or a four, but if anyone's coming in brand new, what sort of things are people doing? What We're talking about rigging and banks, and what are you moving offshore? What are you doing? Two seconds, sorry about that. Um, in all honesty, I, um, I would have loved to have ever gone offshore and see what they're doing, but I guess the majority of times it depends on the scope, depends on the age of the asset as well. So, for example, um, it could just be a simple like simple of a task is they've got to they've got to work with pipe first let's say it's a fire pump depends how big it is depends how small it is they could be tasked with the pipe fitters have come in made sure well, obviously all the isolations are done etc the job is safe they just the fire pump isn't quite working right so they basically get all the pipe fitters to come in take part and then the riggers will come in make sure the safe working load is correct get it up move it out and put it into an area where it's safe to be worked on so then the other trades can actually go on and actually achieve their roles because what you may have is, you know, access or egress issues for trying to fix the piece of kit in the situ. So a lot okay. of the time you are helping to move stuff from one area to another to allow others to help. But depending on the job, you know, there, there's multiple things they could be doing. They could be helping to shift gratings. They could be helping um, on really really complex lifts um, involving things that weigh thousands of tons and um, hundreds thousands of tons depending on what it is obviously riggers generally wouldn't be up to thousands of tons apologies but you know tens hundreds of tons you could be you know working with squads of six to eight other people that's how complex the lift is but you know okay. that would be supervised under you know the rigging supervision on board and the plans yeah. would be done by separate lower focal points okay no that sounds good um what sort of what sort of demand are you seeing at the moment? I know it's very seasonal and probably one week is very different than the other. I know just before this webinar, we were talking about how relatively quiet it was in the earlier part of the year and how it's not quiet at all now. Uh, so what demand are you seeing coming through? Yeah, right now, and it's it's always the same, unfortunately, in the oil and gas industry. And, you know, unless things change, it's never going to get any different. So what tends to happen is, say probably October through to February, it's never normally that busy. That's the time of year where the weather's not brilliant. Companies tend to not do jobs when the weather's not great. The reason being is if they plan to do a job, they want maximum productivity on it. So things that would impact those at those time of year are bad lighting, poor weather, and basically delayed flights for the helicopters offshore because of the poor weather. So they plan to do all their work when there's more light in the day. Obviously, they do do operations 24 hours, but obviously, the, the brighter it is all day, the easier, the better the weather tends to be. And in all honesty, 
the calmer the sea state is because what tends to happen on larger jobs is they tend to put vessels or barges alongside it so people are accommodated on there because of the previous issues i'd spoken about with regards to bedding offshore so um everyone always does their jobs over the summer so you tend to find the the industry is so busy between march and september but then more so they tend to do work in really small windows because what they want to do is they want to if they stop producing on their platform it costs them hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars a day so when they do decide that they want to do it they want to do it in the best feasible conditions for doing that and um, the reason we're particularly busy just now is all the oil and gas has to come back onshore somehow this year and what they're doing is where the oil and gas comes back in is one of the well sorry one of the pipelines is the 40s pipeline system it comes in at a little processing facility not so little sorry but it comes in at a processing facility not far north of Aberdeen in a place called Cruden Bay and um, they actually need to change that whole facility to increase what is coming through it so they actually need the oil and gas to stop coming through that for three weeks so they're stopping production for three whole weeks which will cost the companies various hundreds of thousands of pounds during that time so they've all decided if they're connected to this 40s pipeline they're having to shut down anyway so they're going to do as much work as they can across that period and it's created unfortunately and it will always create the same in the industry it's just created create a bottleneck and um, everyone wants the same type of people at the same time and it basically just comes down to who gets the people first because what always happens it tends to come down to the same sort of two three month period every year where people need the same resources at the same time and there's just not enough people yeah with hindsight if people were trained throughout the year or jobs were split throughout the year there'd be far more work to go around but alas it's yeah. not quite like that and i i know there's a um uh someone had asked about salary and there's a pretty much a, an agreed salary offshore um, yeah there is so um not so much an agreed salary for the majority of the positions that we resource were governed by sort of guidelines up until very recently it was governed by um a company called the ocpa which is the offshore Con contractors partnership partnership association and um, yes. it was disbanded at the end of 2020 however we a majority of the companies still use those rates and um, what is a way to come in force from the 1st of May is another agreement that's been governed by the OG UK, which is the oil and gas governing body, and it's called the Energy Services Agreement. So if you are filling the majority of our roles, you'll be under ESA. Everyone, irrespective of where they're going, will be paid the same rate. Um, there's going to be five grades, and depending on what your role is, you fit into one of the five grades. So you are assured that wherever you go and whatever company you go to, the rates of pay will be similar okay not everyone has signed up to it it's not mandatory but up the majority of people who will be working in the north sea have signed up to it if you are working what is known as a staff role and you're working sort of you're on the same asset all the time and um, you're going back on a rotation and it's generally maintenance work that you're doing you will be on a yearly salary and um, so we'll be paid out monthly and they'll tend to vary depending on where you move about but if you, the majority of people who would be going through your center for training are probably more the weekly paid type employees they'll move from company to company and go wherever the work is at the time and um, so it's quite a transient workforce and i guess that's what most of the companies rely on yeah yeah um i can see we we're, we're just getting towards 4 30 now um, so that's probably all we've got time for uh, we managed to answer three or four of the questions there and anything we missed will try and hoe ho into the blog anyway um, it was really good to hear about you know the the process people go through to get training uh, understanding the the apito side the says one two three four and how those timelines work um, particularly how new people can come in you know if um, employers do look for the more qualified people where it's a bit more they've got the confidence they can come in they can hit the ground running um, but then there are ways that people can come in and, and just start off in the industry uh, because there's we are looking at an aging workforce it's necessary for people to to still come in brand new um, and it was also good to hear that whilst maybe the demand is focused around the, the 40s shutdown and that's driving demand in other areas as well 
Um, but it, it's good to see there is demand in the industry. We hear a lot of noise about oil and gas workforce going down, and really we're not actually seeing that in, in reality anymore. Um, yeah, so that's good to see. I've had a question directly um, to myself, which I think is a good one. I've got a spare minute. Um, Charlie, on. obviously I'd mentioned it as well, right? So someone's messaged me, is there any plans to keep people working after the tar season, I guess? Yeah, for a company like Wood, we're not just relying on the tar season. We have various clients between just our upstream business that I work in. We've got our process and energy business, which is the downstream and um, the appeal qualification would be suitable for a lot of those sites as well. But we also, there's project scopes that would be going. So we do have work July, August, September, October time as well, which will keep, keep hopefully keep people tidied over. But I guess overall as an industry, it's been discussed over several years, but I think the OG UK are quite keen to actually try and get all the operators to agree to spread their work out so that yeah. we don't keep experiencing the same problems that we've always been experiencing. Unfortunately, a service company like Wood don't ha have a say in that, but from my perspective, from someone who's worked in the industry and resource mainly just rigging and banks the whole time, it would be massively ideal and very beneficial if something like that could happen. Yeah, and then just for those that don't know, what do you refer to as the TAR season? Oh, sorry, TAR, TAR is just an acronym. Sorry, should have said that. Stands for turnaround. Um, so, depend on where you go, they'll either be called a shutdown or a turnaround. Um, and sometimes it depends on the duration of them. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just depends on the client. It is when the asset stops producing oil and gas for a set period of time to allow for more jobs to be done. Work can be done when oil and gas is being produced. However, once you stop producing oil and gas, you can actually get in and get into a lot of the equipment that otherwise you wouldn't be able to look at because it's running constantly to keep things moving offshore. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And thank you very much. Um, so I think that's great for anyone that's joined us. Um, this video will be shared uh, online for those that uh, registered and are, are watching this after the event. We will send you the video. Um, but otherwise, uh, from me, uh, just remains to say thank you very much, Sean, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, really insightful. Thank you very much. And to Steve, thank you very much for taking time out to come up and, and talk to people. Well, thanks thank for you having me. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Cheers, guys.